Uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit about us. We are a think tank. Uh, we focus on emerging issues uh, and thinkers and solutions. Uh, the idea being that you get new people to attack old problems and identify new problems, you're going to come up with better ways to solve them. Uh, we do that through a fellows program through the event series, which is uh, what this is part of, and through World Policy Journal, which is like a quarterly journal, and I that hope, hope you will all subscribe if you're not uh, subscribed so yet. Paul here is an assistant professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, where he teaches courses on post-conflict reconstruction and political economy. Um, he's worked at the World, uh, World Bank, the United Nations, uh, given a TED talk, addressed the Oslo Freedom Forum, and the International Baccalaureate Organization, served as a Fulbright Specialist, um, and is a young global leader. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about today is, is really just a brief overview of, of, of a couple of ideas from the book. There's, there's just way too much in there to, to, to speak to you uh, for 10 minutes about, but, but uh, the, the presentation is just a few minutes, and I want to uh, just give you a context. So. Um, uh, as, as Chris mentioned, I, I teach at the uh, Naval Postgraduate School, and I try to. And, uh, and my students are junior military officers in uh, all the military services. Uh, they are oftentimes uh, just back from Afghanistan and Iraq. And, uh, and I often t they often want to, I teach courses on how to rebuild countries after war, so they often want to know, you know, just give us the guidelines as to how, how to rebuild the countries that we just broke, right? Uh, and I have to tell them that it's a lot more complicated than just doing a blueprint where you're just going to have you know, an architectural plan, engineer this country back into one piece, and that too often it's a lot more like really the, the, the appropriate metaphor is gardening, where the weather changes and the uh, conditions, uh, keep, you keep having to adjust to conditions. So this is, this is really all about uh, control and the illusion of control. So, uh, in gardening, gardeners have no illusion of control. Uh, we create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set up our lifestyles so we have time to tend to our crops, and we plant a diverse variety of sturdy, healthy plants and watch them grow. We adjust as we go along, removing excess weeds, mulching, watering, fertilizing when necessary, and picking off pests. But ultimately, the end result almost always includes crop failures and unexpected successes. And we feel more like stewards, sometimes we can observe as a master of our domain. Now, of course, listening to this from a guy who actually has more of a brown thumb than a green thumb is kind of strange, but, but uh, that's kind of the, the, the idea that undergirds the book. I, I really try to make sure that, that throughout the book there's this idea of we've got to adjust and adapt to the conditions on the ground, and we've got to listen to people. So, so here's, one, here's one example. Um, here's a table. I know it's a lot for the morning to digest. But actually, just focus on the red numbers. Basically, this is a picture of Cambodia's aid, tax, and domestic revenue picture from 2000 to 2010. And when you look at the first one here, 94.3, that's the average between 2002 and 2010. That 94.3 uh, percent. That, that for every uh, essentially uh, for uh, every dollar that uh, Cambodia received, uh, or that Cambodia spent, 94.3 cents was essentially spent. Uh, it, was, it was essentially received in aid. Uh, the next number is 9.2 percent. That's the, the uh, percentage of aid as a, uh, uh, as a uh, percent of GNI, gross national income. So that's GDP, GDP basically, income. And if you look at taxes, that's 8.7 percent. Cambodia received more in aid than it, re than it collected in taxes. And in terms of domestic revenues, which includes tax revenues, it's just slightly more than what Cambodia received in terms of of aid. So just, just to wrap this up around your head, I mean, for every uh, dollar that Cambodia's government spent, it got 94.3 cents in foreign aid. And, and what does that mean in terms of tax revenues? Well, I mean, it just means that you have less of an incentive to collect taxes because you're getting a lot of money from outside. And what does that mean in terms of democracy? Well, the link between people and their government is, is kind of tenuous at that point because if you're not paying taxes, why would you have a say in what happens in your government, right? The, the people, the, the leadership would think, well, you're not really part of the process. It's just like taxation without representation. Well, no taxation means no representation. Uh, and where, what's the difference in terms of money? How does it make up uh, the rest of it? Well, it gets foreign aid, but, but more importantly, corruption is essentially 
uh, a huge problem. And I, and I would argue that the, the difference between how much it collects and what it collects in tax revenues and how much it, uh, it sees in corruption essentially would make the, the country normal. So if you actually converted all the corruption money into tax revenues, you would have enough uh, uh, revenues for the country to, to move forward. So in the mid-2000s, that was about three to five hundred million dollars. That was probably a low estimate then. It's, a, it's probably a lot more now. So what happens in the meantime to democracy and governance? Well, you can look at, at indicators like you know, uh, a voice and accountability, for example, from 1996 to 2008. Uh, more or less a decline, except for the last couple of years, where from 2006 to 2008 there's a slight improvement. But the only the only actual indicator you can see that improves is is political stability, which is not surprising because you've had the same person in charge of the country since 1985. Um, that's 27 years of the same prime minister, and in and in this uh, sort of diagram, the keys in black here, and the rest of the people around him are all the in-laws who actually control uh, various ministries. The only person who's definitely not alive anymore is the chief of police uh, who died in a helicopter crash a couple of years ago, but everything remains the same. So uh, <clears throat> how to bring that into the context of uh, an example of rule of law, because the, the first chapter of the book is actually this analysis of 100 plus countries and the relationship between aid and governance. Um, and the one thing that looks kind of negative is rule of law. So let's look at rule of law in the context of Cambodia and see whether something uh, can be drawn from it. And the only example, the one example I want to give to you is what Chris was talking about, uh, this article uh, in uh, the World Policy Journal on Bangkok Lake. So you had this, this, these good intentions, let's build property rights. So from 2008 to 2012, uh, Bangkok Lake, which has 20,000 people around it, about three to four thousand families. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible piece of, of real estate, right? So it's in the middle of the city, of the capital city, and uh, you know I spent some, many a sunsets there. Uh, uh, wonderful place, refreshing. And from the air, it looked like this. And what's happened? It was purchased by a Chinese backed company that um, filled it in. And um, that has been. That's actually it a few months ago now. It's already completely filled in more or less. But how did it do this? Well, it, it essentially uh, took uh, mud from the river next to the lake and pumped it into the lake. Uh, and uh, the houses around the lake have essentially been uh, inundated or flooded with mud. Uh, so people who were living around the lake no longer have homes. Um, and the, the reason why it's interesting that the uh, donors were somehow involved in this is that the World Bank had a land titling project right around this time, and somehow got duped into not giving uh, the people around the lake land an titles. And we told them, forget about these people, let's focus on other parts of the country. So what happened? Of course, the, the people who lived around the lake, some of whom were offered $7,500 in terms of, of compensation, didn't, uh, which is, by the way, a pittance. It's 100000 minimum for the properties around that lake. Uh, it, Protested, and then you had a, a backlash, violence against them, uh, and uh, and beatings. So let me just close that thought uh, in, in my presentation, just to give you a sense. With you know, more recently you had the Coney 2012 video, right? This this video that that in 20 days of being on YouTube was watched by 85 million people. Um, and in the book, I argue that actually it brings up a, 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 a an interesting idea that 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 you know we. Everybody wants to do good, right? But the, 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 the path to disaster is it indeed oftentimes paved with good intentions. And uh, the, the writer Teju Cole in The Atlantic said that you know, there's much more to doing good than uh, good work than making a difference. There's the principle of first do no harm. Uh, there's the idea that those who are being helped ought to be consulted over matters of concern. And I would argue that a Hippocratic oath of sorts to development where first you would ask for you know, not doing harm and you would want genuine participation uh, would make sense. All right, so that's just a very brief uh, overview. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>